Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Okay, let us uh, just continue with what we have said. Last time we have just said about this ketone effects, 2 alkyl ketone effect, 3 alkyl ketone effect and then I said there is 4 alkyl ketone effect also uh, and uh, but I did not elaborate on that 4 alkyl ketone effect. Uh, in other systems, another interesting system is instead of a ketone, if you have a double bond here suppose and this double bonds will have substituents at this position. Okay. Now, in that case, it will be also very similar because of this double bond. Now, this equatorial hydrogen will be equatorial hydrogen will be uh, will be eclipsing this one that is no doubt, but this is quite close to this R2 on this side and the equatorial hydrogen here that will also be quite close to, to R1. But if it is hydrogen, it does not suffer much interaction. But suppose this is not hydrogen, if the R I place here and if the hydrogen is here, then what happens? There will be steric compression between R and the R2. Okay. And that steric compression will be reduced if it goes into this form, if it flips and goes into this is R2 R1 but now this R is in the axial position where this type of steric interaction is not present. So, this is cyclohexane alkene system. I can make the system here for you. Uh, this is the cyclohexane cyclohex exo cyclohexene. So, cyclohexane attached to the exo double bond and if you see that there are um, now if I put this group in the equatorial position. So, what I was pointing out is uh, sorry this is just coming up uh, coming um, yes this is the this is the cyclo uh, this cyclohexane alkylidin system. Now, this is the group which is suppose R 1 or R 2 and this is the equatorial group at C 2. Okay. So, you see how close are they. So, they are now sterically crowding each other. Okay. Now, if you invert it, if you now do the flipping, so you see this is the double bond going away from this group. Now, because this group is in the axial position. So, axial orientation you do not have this strain because they are far apart now. The groups attached to this exocyclic carbon is no longer uh, in proximity with the axial alkyl group. Okay. Now, this is what is called. So, these systems also will have considerable amount of considerable amount of this type of this axial way of axial conformer. And like your 2 alkyl and 3 alkyl ketone effects, they, this, this has also a name, this is called allylic 1 3 strain. Allylic 1 3 strain, why? Because this is your suppose this because the strain is between the substituents at attached to C 1, then 1, 2, 3, and attached to C 3. So, because it is the strain between the substituents attached to C 1 and C 3. So, this is called allylic 1 3 strain. Okay. These are some interesting features, they are very important while dealing with reactivity of molecules. Okay. So, we have seen so far, we have just been dealing with the preferred conformation of different, first we did acyclic systems and then we studied the. Uh, 
some other acyclic systems, then the cyclic systems and special cyclic systems uh, like cyclohexanone or alkylidine cyclohexane that means cyclohexane with exocyclic double bond and we have seen that according to the situation the preferred conformation varies. Okay. The factors that need to be considered while drawing the preferred conformations are first of all the torsional strain, then the steric strain, torsional strain is also the eclipsing strain is similar to the torsional strain and then uh, the steric strain that is the size effect, then you have the hydrogen bond effect, you have dipole dipole repulsion. So, these are the things which you need to consider while arriving at a conclusion to draw the preferred conformation of a molecule. Okay. Now, this stereochemistry what we have learned so far is what is called static stereochemistry means we have only checked the conformation and we have only checked the energy differences between the between the possible conform conformers and that is it we did not we did not say anything about the reactivity uh, of these molecules reactivity of these molecules means this conformation analysis has two aspects. I gave you the definition of conformation analysis. One is conformation analysis deals with the variation of energy as you rotate the system, as you rotate around carbon carbon bonds, as you flip a system like cyclohexane, then how the energy changes that is what is uh, uh, what is called the this is one type of conformation analysis with respect to energy. There is another type of conformation analysis which is the versus which is uh, which takes care of the reactivity that means how the reactivity pattern of a molecule changes uh, with different conformations of a system. Okay. Now, this is what is called dynamic stereochemistry. So, now the topic is going to change now dynamic. So, what we have seen so far is static stereochemistry. So, the molecules are just seen in isolation there is no partner to react with we just check the energy and the different types of interactions that are present in the system. Now, the next question is how these different types of interactions and different types of conformers are going to affect the reactivity of the system. So, this is what is called dynamic stereochemistry. Dynamic means what is the the other way to tell it is as conformation and reactivity. So, now the reactivity that means the reactivity issue is brought in that how does the different conformers uh, affect the reactivity of a system conformation and reactivity. Now, this conformation and reactivity concept that actually conformation also dictates the reactivity was um, was put forward by a British scientist uh, very elaborately his name was Sir Derek Barton he was at Imperial College and he wrote uh, a paper uh, in a journal called Experientia uh, that was very famous those times earlier. So, he wrote the conformation analysis of conformation analysis versus reactivity of cyclic systems uh, when there are uh, different uh, types of uh, number when the number of cycles varied. So, he studied the cyclohexane, the decaline and then the, even the bigger ones like steroids and terpenes because they have similar kind of decaline systems. Okay. His name was Barton. Now, Barton before Barton uh, there was uh, another professor from Norway. He uh, first pointed out say if Barton has elaborated the whole concept, but the whole thing started. Uh, with uh, a person called Odd Hassel. He was a Norwegian scientist and he was studying the pKa values of cyclohexane carboxylic acids. Okay. Now, cyclohexane carboxylic acids if you put a tertiary butyl suppose I am not very sure whether this was the example, but the essence of his study is uh, can be described with the help of these molecules. So, he was studying the, the pKa of cyclohexane carboxylic acids. He took one molecule where the carboxy is in the equatorial position and he took another molecule where the carboxy is in the axial position. 
but in order to lock the system see you need a locking group i already told you tertiary butyl is a locking group it it prevents the molecule to flip so there is no interconversion between actual carboxy versus equatorial carboxy so he was uh, trying to measure the pk now interestingly what he observed is that the pk of the two compounds are first of all not same so this is a very interesting thing that where the electronic effects obviously will be similar in the both the in both the cases the electronic effects will all will be the similar because the connectivity is same so and the t butyl group is far away so it's inductive effect the electron donating effect cannot reach this carbon even if it reaches the carbon it reaches this carbon to the same extent like this molecule in this molecule also so there is no electronic effect that can that can uh, say that there will be a pk difference but he found a pk difference and what he found is that this has this is a stronger acid than this one so this is a weaker acid so weaker acid means higher pa pk so this is higher pk and this is lower pk okay so this is stronger acid so that is the starting point of confirmation and reactivity concept so that means the property of this molecule the reactivity uh, the reactivity as an acid of these molecules depend on the conformation whether it is adopting an equatorial co2h or an axial co2h this was studied by odd hassel so then he what was the explanation the explanation was that the pk is measured by the dissociation constant so it dissociates into the carboxylate now the more the carboxylate you have that means more dissociation you have that means the acidity will increase okay now this is the carboxylate in the equatorial position this is the carboxylate in the axial position now you know that uh, there is a huge role that is played by the solvent in stabilizing this anionic species okay this carboxylate so this carboxylate will be solvated will be solvated will be stabilized by solvation and this will also be solvated now the problem is the solvation of this axial carboxy will be little bit hindered because of the presence of these hydrogens okay so because of the presence of these hydrogens solvation will be less here that means solvation stabilization through solvation will be less here this on the other hand because it is in the equatorial phase so there is no such interaction can be conceived because there is no one three diaxial interaction so solvation will be more here that means stabilization through solvation will be more here that means dissociation of the corresponding acid to the carboxylate that means the equatorial acid to the carboxylate will be more than the dissociation of the axial carboxylic acid to its carboxylate so that is due to the problem of problem of solvation in the axial carboxylate because solvation means size increase and size increase means more or greater steric repulsion okay so that's why this dissociates more that means the equatorial carboxy and that became the that has got the higher acidity that means lower pk so that is the starting point of the whole story but this is a a, a thermodynamic uh, parameter the pka what about the the what when the reactivity we say this is a kind of thermodynamic parameter pk that is acidity uh, but we have to also uh, bring in the kinetic parameter in order to uh, in order to study the reactivity of this type of molecules which can exist in different conformations okay so before we we will discuss some of the uh, some of the issues that that barton had dealt with uh, one of them is confirmation and reactivity one example is suppose i want to oxidize two compounds one is cis four tertiary butyl sorry tertiary butyl cyclohexanol and the corresponding trans compound the trans 
four tertiary butyl cyclohexanol. If I want to, so what, which one will oxidize? So, oxidation profile, that means which one will be oxidized more or at a faster rate. Now, we are bringing in the kinetics, okay, at a faster rate than the other, okay. Now, you know that this is an alcohol, alcohols can be oxidized by chromic acid. Suppose we are using chromic acid, in fact, Barton uh, was studying the chromic acid oxidation of the C centrans for tertiary butyl cyclohexanol. Okay, now, in order to uh, arrive at an answer, so what we need to do, we have to first draw the, the molecules. So, the, so, this is your cis tertiary butyl cyclohexanol and the trans one is this is the alpha OH. Okay. Now, from the planar system, you cannot actually arrive at a conclusion. So, what you have to do, you have to draw the correct conformation of these systems. Now, these are locked systems. Okay. So, one good thing is that they are locked systems. So, there is no question of uh, flexibility in these molecules. They are locked because of the tertiary butyl. So, there will not be any interconversion between the equatorial wedge or the axial wedge. Okay. So, this cis compound has an axial wedge and the equatorial compound will then have an, uh, this trans compound will have an equatorial wedge. Okay. So, these are the two conformations. Now, if we, we know that the chromic acid oxidation uh, or if you do not know, let me tell you that the chromic acid oxidation actually takes place via formation of, so this is the chromic acid, the anhydride CRO3. So, the first step is that which attacks the chromium and this goes to the, so this is in the plus 6 state, sorry, plus 6. Okay. So, first the which attacks the chromium and it becomes R C H C R which because it is done in sulfuric acid. So, there will be lot of proton sources double bond O and double bond O. Okay. So, then, so this is what is called the, sorry, this is O C H O C R O. So, R C H 2 O, this hydrogen will be lost after the nucleophilic attack. O C R O H and then C R double bond O C R double bond O. This is what is called a chromate ester. Why ester? Because this is basically chromic acid and an alcohol, so that makes a chromate ester. So the next step, so this is not the oxidation. Remember, chromic chromium is still in the six oxidation level. So in the oxidation, chromium will be reduced. So this is the first step, and the second step is that a base which is most likely to be the water that is present, little water that is present in the system. So, it comes or it could be bisulphate also if there is sulfuric acid. So, that comes and takes this hydrogen as a proton, this comes here and now the chromium is reduced and gets the two electrons onto it. So, chromium gets to the fourth plus four state and then it then distributes and then it disproportionates into plus three and plus six. Okay. But that is the more important issue is that there are that this gets oxidized. Okay. There is a creation of a double bond O in the system. So, this gets oxidized and the that means the rate of chromic acid oxidation now it involves two steps. Now, which is the rate determining step? That is the very important issue here. Okay. Now, what has been found that this is a very fast step and this is the slow step. So, if this is the slow step, that means the breakdown of the chromate ester is the rate determining step. So, breakdown of the chromate ester is the rate determining step. Okay. So, this is on the side. So, we know that first this will form a chromate ester. So, R C R double bond O double sorry huh, R C R double bond O double bond O. OH and then this H equatorial H has to be taken up by the base to form the cyclohexanone 
and in case of the in case of the axial wage uh, equatorial wage sorry that was we started with the axial wage the axial chromatester decomposition of the axial chromatester and that will give to the the tertiary butyl cyclohexanone this will also lead to tertiary butyl cyclohexanone but via an equatorial chromatester o cr double bond o wage and then double bond o and then this axial hydrogen has to be picked up by the base which is water here and this is the mechanism so you have a tertiary butyl so that goes to the same compound as this so final product is same so now the question is which one will be oxidized at a faster rate first it was um, uh, first barton gave an uh, an explanation which relied on the abstraction of this equatorial hydrogen versus axial hydrogen so he argued that the axial hydrogen will be more difficult to pick up because the water has to come i i showed from this side but you you see there are axial hydrogen so basically if the water approach of the water to abstract the hydrogen uh, will be more difficult because this phase is sterically hindered than the approach of water to abstract the hydrogen from the equatorial side that was barton's explanation so he said the equatorial the essence is that the axial hydroxy the axial hydroxy that means the cis compound cis for tertiary butyl cyclohexanol should be oxidized faster at a faster rate because it involves the abstraction of an equatorial hydrogen which is the more accessible okay and uh, this is oxidized at a slower rate because it involves the abstraction of a hydrogen at the axial position however later on it was found we are not going into very big details but later on it was found that this type of explanation was not correct the actual explanation um, after studying several other compounds uh, different substituted cyclohexanes Asian Mosher another scientist he gave uh, what is called an explanation based on what is called steric acceleration I think you will be amazed to know this word because I am sure so up till now what you are told that steric factor is always a very bad thing it slows down the reaction um, slows down the reaction but this is an example what Asian Mosher is telling he is a Swiss scientist he said that the reason that this is oxidized at a faster rate is what is called steric acceleration that means here the rate determining step is the second step that means decomposition of the chromatester now the chromatester this is very big but axial group was earlier weight when it forms the chromatester it becomes big and now it is suffering from enormous steric compression however formation of the chromatester is not is not the rate determining step if that was the rate determining step then this 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 would have been slow but this is a very fast step and so it is formed irrespective of whether it, there is increase of steric compression or not now the steric compression has increased so now the decomposition in the decomposition step that means the decomposition of the chromatester now the chromatester will decompose very rapidly in the axial chromatester because there is release of enormous release of steric strain so this is what is called he called as steric acceleration that means the steric factor or steric compression is accelerating the the next step the the oxidation okay the loss of the hydrogen so it is not the that the hydrogen is more accessible the accessibility of the hydrogen is not the factor it is the release of the steric strain which is much more in the axial compound axial chromatester than in equatorial chromatester where it does not suffer from such type of strain so this there is no steric strain release in this case there may be some but much not to the extent in the axial that is present in the axial in the axial isomer so now this will be so that is the reason due to steric acceleration this equator uh, this axial wage 
is oxidized at a faster rate. Okay. There are again very similar examples where there is a difference. So, I have given you a difference between the pK of the carboxylic acids when they are in the axial and the equatorial positions. Next, I have talked about the rate of oxidation of an axial alcohol uh, versus an axial uh, equatorial alcohol. Now, I will tell you a third example which is the saponification of an ester molecule in a cyclohexane system if the ester is in the axial position or in the equatorial position. So, what is the rate? So, again I take two compounds. See tertiary butyl is always required. So, that equilibration between the axial and the equatorial does not take place because we are comparing the rates of the axial and the equatorial uh, equatorial systems. So, the whole thing will be will become complicated if there is equilibration between the two. So, to stop that equilibration you have to put the the tertiary butyl group. Now, what we are talking about the problem is that we are talking about the hydrolysis of a of an ester when it is in the axial group versus the hydrolysis of an ester when it is in the equatorial position. Okay. Let us see because I said equatorial because I know that if I want to draw this into the perfect in the conformation in the Packard conformation. So, this will be the equatorial one and this will be the axial one. Okay. The question is which one will saponify faster? Saponification means hydrolysis in a basic condition. Okay. So, if I hydrolyze it under a basic condition that means, O H minus is the nucleophile. Okay. So, which one will hydrolyze at a faster rate? Now, this is interesting unlike the axial alcohol versus equatorial alcohol. Now, it is the other way around the equatorial acetate that the equatorial ester will be hydrolyzed faster as compared to the axial ester. Now, what is the reason here? The reason is that again the mechanism has to be brought in that what is the mechanism of saponification? Take a very general case R C O O O say O A M E and if you add alkali. So, the first step is this attacks this goes back. So, R C O minus then O H then O A M E. So, this is the tetrahedral intermediate and then so this is the first step and the second step is expulsion of this O M E. So, you get R C double bond O O H plus O M E minus and then there is mutual exchange of the hydrogen because this is a stronger base and this is so that will abstract the hydrogen from here and this is the weaker base. So, it will be the carboxylate plus methanol. So, that is the mechanism. Now, this is a very fast step. This is also very fast step. The rate determining step is the is this one the attack by the OH minus. So, this is the slow step that means this is the rate determining step. So, what happens in the rate determining step that will guide the process. So, when OH minus attacks I, I again remind you that is the rate determining step. So, there will be increase of steric bulk in the axial system okay. O minus O A M E and then O H. Okay. Then there is this hydrogens. So, there is this increase of steric strain I if due to the O H minus attack and that is the first step that is the rate determining step. So, this will be slower as compared to the attack by this O H minus into the carboxylate into this ester carbonyl because there is even if the size increases there is no increase of steric strain here, but there is increase of steric strain here. So, this will be slow and that will be fast. So, here interestingly the breakdown of this tetrahedral intermediate is not the rate determining step and that is why this whole result has gone just the reverse way. Now, the equatorial ester is hydrolyzed faster because the the step where the steric side increases that is the determining step. 
in chromatic acid uh, oxidation the step where the steric bulk reduces that becomes the red determining step. So, that is why we see different results in both these systems. Thank you.